Hello and welcome to Pods Like Us. I'm Martin Quibell, known to my friends as Marv, and this time I am speaking with Ian from Cold War Conversations. Hey Ian, thanks for speaking with me today. Marv, thanks very much for having me on Pods Like Us. Came across your podcast a few weeks back, and really what you're doing is bringing podcasters together and picking their brains and finding out their sort of like origin stories. And delighted that you've decided that my podcast is worthy of being in your pantheon of other podcasts. I think it's more than worthy because we're going to get to it to pull away the curtain. We'll get to that when we get to point number nine on the list. Because I think your show is important and a lot of history shows are important because I think it's it's important to make sure that these things in our histories are uh, remain relevant and people know about it for the for, for for the future because i believe that in a sense people that try to hide or pretend that things didn't happen in the past have got it wrong whereas if you remember things that happened in the past you can actually learn from those things and that's how the world i think evolves is to learn from things that we've done in the past whether the mistakes or whatever you, you look at the wars and things that they are mistakes, but if you learn from those as opposed to hiding from those, I think it's better. Yeah, I think you're right. I think uh, what a lot of people find frustrating is people don't appear to learn from their history and you do see history repeating itself. But for me, it's preserving people's personal stories of the cold war and Often they're stories that wouldn't be noticed. They wouldn't be a footnote even in a history book. It's great to be able to share these stories and get in really amongst the weeds of what was it like to live through the Cold War on both sides of the the Iron Curtain, let's say. Absolutely. I remember when I was a kid, I was brought up. My, my own father was, my, well, my dad was stationed in Dusseldorf. Uh, so there's a history there with the army. And then my uncle was in the armed forces as well. He served in, he served as a, a, a bomb disposal in, in Northern Ireland. But so we've got that sort of like history there. What actually was, what started you with the interest in this subject itself? The cold war was really my formative years. I was born around about the time of the Cuban missile crisis, although obviously wouldn't have known much about it. The Berlin Wall came down in my late 20s. And at that point, I thought I'm actually living through real history. This is something that is going to be remembered for a long time and is going to be a big thing in the history books, but didn't really think that much more about it. I was very aware of the impending uh, doom from nuclear weapons and a nuclear war during the Cold War. It seemed like the Soviet Union was going to last forever. And that confrontation between the West and the the Eastern Bloc was always going to be there. And it, you could argue in some ways there was a bit of comfort about that because it, it seemed like a much more straightforward world. They were the baddies and we were the goodies, from for, certainly from a Western perspective. Whereas nowadays, with asymmetric warfare and growth in in terrorism, it's a much more complicated world, I think, now. Absolutely. But the good guys and the bad guys, the black and white of it all, is the same from both angles, I would have thought. I would have thought that from their point of view, because of the way that the news was reported on their end, it essentially, it's, it's almost like propaganda. So it is so... I'm just assuming that it would have been like that from their side as well. It would have been. When I interview people from the Eastern Bloc, often they're listening to Western radio. 
things like Voice of America and the BBC World Service because they know that the news that they get domestically is sanitized for the regime they're, they're living under, um, what way of controlling the population, particularly in East Germany, a lot of that population watched West German TV. I keep coming across big fans of Dallas and dynasty in, uh, in East Germany. And I guess that was easier because they had another country who spoke the same language and therefore was broadcasting in the same language. Whereas if you lived in Czechoslovakia or Bulgaria, you weren't necessarily going to get that, that sort of level, level of broadcast. But yeah, propaganda plays a very big part on both sides as far as trying to show each side in the best way to the other side. A, a lesson that we still haven't learned from because that with America in things that their previous president would say on the, on news items. So what, what was your inspiration behind starting the show then? I've always enjoyed being creative and I came across podcast about six or seven years ago. Yep. And one podcast I listened to regularly at that point was a podcast called Spybury, yes. um, which was about uh, spy novels and spy books. And speaking to the host there, Shane, he had an interest in East Germany and he suggested that I did an East German podcast. And I thought, well, I want to do something a bit broader than that, that gives more room for subjects and opportunities. And at that time, I'd recently done an interview with my father, who was a World War II veteran. Yep. And it was mainly really around wanting to capture his story. It wasn't intended for broadcast or anything like that. And I was thinking the Cold War was a very important part of my life. And I hadn't found anywhere where those stories were being recorded and being captured. And I knew that particularly with World War II, a lot of people's personal experience were never captured in the form of audio. They may have been captured in the form of writing. And indeed, the Imperial War Museum does have a decent archive of audio interviews. But I thought, mm, I can't really see anybody out there looking at the Cold War. So that's where it started, really to try and record an oral history of the Cold War in all its aspects. So it's not just soldiers and spies, it's the civilian experience as well. And what I really enjoy doing is finding a story that I know that has never been heard before and with a number of the guests that i've interviewed they've said you know what i've never actually told my family about this story yeah. because i just think that they wouldn't be interested in it and that's a common actual phrase that i get is why would somebody be interested in what my life was like during that period and i said there's a hundred thousand listens a, a month to this podcast there's a huge audience out there who want to understand more about the cold war that's incredible. Well, like we were saying before we officially started the show, my, my background would be that my own dad was in uh, stationed in Dusseldorf, so we were in Germany, but I don't, re I don't remember us ever going into, to, to the other side. Uh, to the, to, um, yeah, so this is strange because then the way that I was brought up, and I think you're different, uh, the way that I was brought up, I was looking at it from the outside, and there was almost like this... Um, it, it was almost like it, it gave this really strange aura about it when you're looking at it from the outside of like these people just living in this really down situation and it just had that, whereas I'm guessing that it, it wasn't to that sort of degree over there, uh, especially considering that I've seen uh, footage of people, musicians who've gone and recorded over there, for instance who've said that it wasn't like that and they find it a completely different experience. So, it's, yeah. It, it is. It's much more nuanced than that. that. That's the classic view. You've got to remember people fell in love, got married, had kids, same thing, worked for their entire life, retired, got a pension. All, all of that sort of thing happened in the Eastern Bloc as well. And whilst it, it appears as though Everybody was under the eye of the secret police and stuff like that. And it was really oppressive. For some people, it wasn't. Obviously, yeah. for dissidents and others, they had a really bad time there. 
But for a lot of people, it was a relatively comfortable life. The work wasn't brilliant. They didn't really have a lot of variety in the shops, but what you didn't know, you didn't miss. It's, it's a mixed bag of what I get there, but it's not all doom and gloom. And it said, I did an interview with a author who'd written a recent history of East Germany, and she was brought up as a kid. She was quite young when the Berlin Wall fell. And she'd been doing a lot of research about the wider experience of the population there. And a lot of people in enjoyed their life there. And indeed, there's still a significant number of people who miss that country doesn't exist anymore, where they had high levels of childcare, no worries about unemployment, that sort of thing. But that system wasn't sustainable. And essentially, the country was going to go bankrupt if the wall hadn't have come down anyway. Yep. That's one of the one of the great things about your show is that you are bringing you are highlighting this this fact that things weren't that way completely and that there are these other there's almost like some really nice sweet anecdotal stories from some of the people that you have on as well that make you it's strange because it's like a realization that all these years or all that time ago things weren't the way that you were thinking that they were or that you perceived them to be and yeah and in, in a sense you can almost dare i say be envious in a sense of the s more simplistic way of life in a sense as well yeah yeah i recently released an episode in fact last saturday i released an episode with a woman who had on her own gone hitchhiking across poland in the 1960s and she didn't have a lot of money with her. She just got off a train and just started walking. And almost without fail, she was invited into people's homes and put up and looked after. And she was a bit of a an oddity, a British woman wandering around Poland during the middle of the Cold War. But it's a lovely story because it just shows the warmth and the kindness of people during that and almost an innocence of the people then. I don't want to sound a bit too condescending there. It was, a, as you say, a much simpler time without mobile phones and social media and stuff like that. Not that it's all bad, but it was, yeah, a, a much more straightforward, but a hard life. I mean, she was going through... She was very interested in rural life. So she was seeking out quite remote areas of Eastern Europe. And she was coming across people who could speak three or four different languages because they were right in the borderlands where the borders merged with, with other countries there. But despite knowing those languages, they were relatively uneducated. And she had one woman who, who asked her whether England had a moon as well. But again, th this woman was really intelligent in so much that she was able to speak three or four different languages, but lovely little vignettes and stories that I come across, which really make the every interview really special and different views, even on the same subject from different people or people who lived in the same town as well. Yeah, that's the thing. You, It's interesting that way as well, because you're looking at that subject, but some people might think that it's like this and this, but it's the fact that you get all these people in there. So you've had the writers, you've had that person there that did the walking across Poland. You've had the, recently I listened to that episode, like I said, with the chap who was working, with, what, he was in the army and he was working with the nuclear bombs. And, and Yeah, he was in the US yeah. army on a uh, base handling nuclear artillery shells. And it, it ranges, one of the areas I've been really interested in getting into is stories about the military, the other side of the Iron Curtain. Yep. And I managed to find a East German soldier who'd, who'd served. And what I tend to find is I put out an episode and that draw that I, I then get people who've had similar experiences contacting me. And it led me to doing, I've got probably another one or two East German army stories to uh, put out, yeah. but I got in, I ended up getting in contact with an East German tank commander and his views were, were really interesting about what would have happened if the cold war had gone hot and how he was trained and the ideology that they were, that they were fed there. So it's pretty unique insight and it, 
being a podcaster, one of the things you always think is, oh, I'm going to run out of subjects to cover. Whereas with this, there, there isn't anything mm. you can run out. And I try and mix it up. So it's not all oral history interviews. It's also author interviews, because I think one of the episodes you listened to was one of my author interviews. I've done one where I've almost done like a lecture, which makes it sound really boring, but it was it, it has done really well download wise. Yeah. And that's one thing that I'm looking to branch into because sometimes I have a subject where I can't find an oral, somebody to give me an eyewitness account for, I'd, and that is a subject that I'd like to cover. So that, that will be one angle there. I've also did an interview with a tour guide in Berlin, <laughs> present day tour guide, talking about what's the Cold War history you can find in Berlin. And I'm looking to extend that into other locations as well, because that episode did really was shared a lot. So it, it's keeping it fresh because it would be very easy for me to do episodes about spies every week. Yep. And I'd have a very popular podcast doing that. But what I'm finding with my listenership and the feedback I get is they enjoy the variety. They never know what's going to be appearing each week. And that keep keeps them interested and they appear to enjoy my interview style as well for reasons i don't know about but anyway yeah that's what i was go going towards was the fact that for, for a subject like this where people might think that it's just going to be like this there's so much variety there in the different types of people that you have and the subjects that you cover that it is incredible i was just thinking just now have you ever had, had like a family or a group of people who are like friends on the show and then discuss their collective? Uh... Yeah, I've had a couple of episodes where we've done, where there's been more than one guest on the show. One of my favorites was with a father and daughter. Yeah. And that was an interesting story in the way that I discovered their story. Twitter is a channel I use quite a lot. And I was scanning through there and this video popped up and it said, This is my father having his last beer down the pub before lockdown. And this time, 75 years ago, he was handed a machine gun and told to storm the radio station in Budapest. Wow. And I immediately realized that he was a freedom fighter of the Hungarian uprising of 1956. So got in contact with the daughter and we had a lovely chat with the pair of them and I could hear the wine glasses in the background and it's a, a lovely talk. And she said during that interview that he's told you things there that I never knew about, that I had no idea about. And it sometimes helps just having a neutral voice in that conversation that makes people, I don't know, talk, talk a little bit more candidly about their experiences. The other one that I've done relatively recently was with a tank commander and his driver. Yep. And that was really nice as well, because you could hear the genuine care that they had for each other and they were bouncing off each other as well. And it added a completely different dimension. And it's something I'd like to do more of. What I'm One of the things I'm planning on doing is a chat with these two British tank guys and the East German tank commander. Yep. to actually hear their different views from both sides um, simultaneously, which I think will be a really interesting episode. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see how their experiences are both similar and different to each other and what what are their, their thoughts about that. Yeah. yeah, and also the misconceptions that each side had about each other as well. I think it, it will become a little bit apparent there, but uh, yeah, that, that in, in the pipeline, in the planning stage. It's war, isn't it? So you're always going to have misconceptions on both sides about yeah. these things. That's, that's yeah. the problem with it. That's why there's war. That's why we have the wars is because of misunderstanding of each other. Yeah. So show in well, yeah, so in, interest in the subject, show inspiration, and developing the show. So how did you get the show off the ground then? I procrastinated for quite some time, and then in March 2018, I think it was, 
I released the first episode, which without doubt has the worst audio I've ever recorded. And so I put a disclaimer on the front of that episode, but I'm thinking of actually getting in contact with that guest again and re-recording it. And I thought maybe I'd get a few hundred listeners who'd be interested. And yeah, did did get um, a few hundred listeners there. But I got in contact with Gary Powers Jr. Now, Gary Powers is quite a well-known name in Cold War history. His father was shot down by the Russians in uh, 1961, I think it was, or 1960. I should know. His father was shot down, imprisoned by the Soviets, and then exchanged at the Bridge of Spies in Berlin. So if anybody's seen that Tom Hanks film with Mark Ryland, Gary Powers is that pilot who's exchanged for Rudolf Abel, the, the Russian spy. Speaking to him, did the interview, great interview. He said, how would you like to speak to the son of Nikita Khrushchev? Now, Nikita Khrushchev was the Soviet leader at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And his son was about 20 years old at that time. Yep. As you can imagine, my reply was pretty quick. Yes, please. And I did a two-part episode with him. And he's no longer with us now. So that episode, I wouldn't be able to do now. But fascinating insight because his father was sharing some details as to what he was having anguish over and what the decision making was that was going on. I'm always disappointed. It's one of the episodes that doesn't get that many listens. I think partially because Sergei Khrushchev, who, who's the interviewee there, has got quite a strong Russian accent. But once you tune in and once you hear what the insights that he's giving, it's well worth a listen. And for me, audio history is such a powerful medium because there's nothing like hearing it from somebody who was there. And you, you get detail and texture that you don't get in a book. Okay, you could read those same words in a book, but to hear it with the pauses and the breaths and the intonation that you get in an audio um, record, I think just brings it alive much more. And I think also not having video as well. That's one of the strengths I think about podcasting is when you're listening, there's almost more concentration. And as they say, the, the best pictures are on radio as well. And I think you, you just get a lot closer to, to the subject through podcasting, but I'd be biased being a history podcaster. So the guest and topics you, you've now the guest and the topics they come to you essentially you're getting people coming to you and going like that one you were saying with the the german officer and then you've got all these other ones who contacted you as well and you've recorded with them but initially how did you get the sort sort out the guest and the decide what topics you were going to discuss in each episode the topics just came with the guest really because at the start, I didn't really, I didn't have any guests. But what I did do is I started a Twitter account before I started the podcast. So I managed to build a little bit of a following there. And I was tracking a number of people on Twitter who were likely guests yep. on there and contacted them directly. Similarly, I started a Facebook group as well. So that allowed the listeners to interact quite effectively if they were on face but but twitter has been one of the main channels and as i described with that guy from the hungarian uprising yep. just got to keep your eyes peeled and realize what you're reading there in a text and thinking actually this person could be if they're who i think that they are then they could be a really interesting guest yeah when you were mentioning that and then you, you said about the 75 years or whatever it was when you said that and going into where he did the radio station I actually caught on to that while you were talking about it because I have a little bit of a very slight, there's some things that in my mind I remember hearing about and things. But, uh, and then, so what sort of research do you do then once you've got the guest? What sort of research do you do leading up to? And do you have notes ready and, and it's like almost like a plan going into the show? I do have a plan. But 
I'm more than happy for that plan to disintegrate as the interview goes on. Often you're not often, but sometimes you'll be interviewing somebody who's quite well rehearsed, has been interviewed multiple times before, and you're always trying to get something else out of the interview. And I, the phrase that I'm always looking for from a guest is something along the lines of, I'd not thought about that. Yeah, let me tell you about that. I've never told anybody about this before or something like that. Is I know there's going to be some gold in there somewhere. That being said, even the the FBI guy that I interviewed the other night at the end of the interview said, God, you asked me quite a few questions there that nobody else has asked me in an interview. So I was pretty chuffed I'd managed to do that with somebody who's an FBI interrogator, essentially. Yeah. But it's really, it, the key is the positive listening, is listening to what your guest is saying, not get hung up on the list of questions that you've got. But listen to what they're saying. And if there's something there that sounds interesting, pursue it. You can always edit it out later if it doesn't lead anywhere. But you never know. It, it might lead to an incredible story that no one's ever heard before. Absolutely. And you get a lot of those as well in your show because of the way that you just, it's almost like you notice a little, it's like a tree that's growing essentially on the in, in the show. And then you notice these little twigs coming off the main branches and it's, oh, that's interesting. And then you go down there to try and see what you get from trying to, where that grows and where it goes to. Yeah, it's useful to know the history and the background. So that's the research that, well, some of this research I've already done because I've been reading about this subject and studying this subject for decades. So that really helps because somebody might say something that a listener might not realize is actually quite interesting. And then I'll try and prize out a bit more information on, on that subject. And as you can see from the background behind me, I've got a little bit of a library of, of books to assist me with that. But with, with the other thing that I do with the guest as well is ask them to just give me some bullet points about their life. Just a few bullet points, because often that, them doing that exercise will bring out more information. And what, as you will know, what will bring alive an interview is anecdotes. Yeah. So that's, I said, look, if you've got anecdotes, little stories, funny, sad, in between just a little bullet point about that just to make sure that we i prompt for that in the questioning and that that appears and i am really showing you a little bit behind the curtain there as to it's not as unrehearsed as perhaps it sounds like in in the podcast and there is some preparation and some to and froing beforehand but at the end of the day I want it to be a genuine account of that person's experiences, but I also want it to be interesting to enough to the listener for them to stay with it right the way through to the end. Yeah, my, on my show, I'm trying to, you, you, it's the thing of it, you, you're trying to get that information that you're initially going into in a sense, or I am, but I'm trying to also make it conversational at the same time. So you can get that, those little bits of gold there in the, the show. Yeah. And it's building that rapport with the guest as well. If you have that pre-call with them, that can help because they then know you and they understand where, you, where you're coming from there. But, but sometimes I'll, I'll do an interview on the basis of an exchange of a few emails, but it's just, you know, you, you need to build that rapport as quickly as you can when you get into the the interview. And I think you can hear that. I can certainly hear that in some of my episodes where it starts off with the guest being a little bit, not monosyllabic, but not giving perhaps lengthy answers. And after a while, they really warm up and start to relax. And then you can get those nuggets of gold as we've described them. Yeah. I mean, what helps with that is the fact that we do long form as well. So if, if you're doing, say, an interview that's, that's 10, 15 minutes, you're going to just get that monoform, as you said, the question, answer, question, answer, and that's what you'll get. But if you do it on long form, say around an hour or even longer, then that does that. You're right. 
when it goes so far with some people who are a bit nervous to start with, they start to relax more and you get that because of it being the long form. Like I said, if, if it was shorter, then you wouldn't be able to ease into it so much. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely. So you've done your research, got the guest, got the topic. So how do you record it? Is it much like we're doing now on a, a Zoom or a Zencaster or something? Yeah, I, most of my interviews are done remotely because of the guest is not near to me in Manchester. And I've used Riverside, I've used Zencaster, and I've used Clean Feed. I started out using Zoom, but wasn't particularly happy with the audio quality. And I find with Zencaster and Riverside, because it records locally, the audio is not compressed. So you tend to get a much better quality of audio there, but I sometimes have challenges with people's technology that they've got at their end, because ideally we want people wearing headphones, a separate mic, and they've got an up-to-date version of Chrome and all of that sort of stuff. But for, for some of them, I will interview them over the phone. So I record directly off a mobile phone. And I've been surprised at some of the quality I've had with that. In fact, the interview from, of the woman who uh, was hitchhiking across Poland, that was recorded over the phone. And to my uneducated ear, it sounds almost as good as a Riverside recording, but sometimes you get poor lines, but I think sometimes that can add to the atmosphere of it, actually. I think so as well. That's I have a romanticism about that. I, I like old, I like, I love audio. I love uh, radio. I grew up listening to the radio a lot. And even now there's some things that have become available on podcasting streaming platforms that are old radio shows or old little bits and things. And I'll gravitate towards those because there's something magical about those old shows. Even if you come across an old little clip of the goons or something or anything from back in the day and i'll always gravitate i love old radio I just brilliant i remember listening on shortwave during the cold war and you could pick up foreign stations so a bit like we were talking about propaganda earlier you'd i could tune into radio moscow and i was always intrigued because they all, all had american accents so it's welcome to radio moscow world service it was a this weird They'd obviously been taught English by an American. And then you could pick up Voice of America and BBC World Service. And if you were lucky, you'd be tuning through the wave bands and you just suddenly come across weird voices reciting numbers. Yep. And those were number stations where they were broadcasting messages to spies that were in place either in the West or in the East. And these were secret messages. And I did an episode on number stations, which is one of the really popular episodes because it's just such a fascinating subject. I'm going to have to find that episode because I'm fascinated with number stations. I'll send uh, you the link to that one. That's a good one. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to that. So then, so then you've done the recording. Do you think you'll then edit it out of interest before we go past this? We're using Zoom because I've got a contract with Zoom at the moment, but I, I wish okay. I could finish it and I'd, I'd go to another, I could use something else if I could, if it wasn't for already having been paid for. Yeah. Shame, really. So what what do you do then with the editing? Because you, you do edit it down, don't you? you, you I do. The, the audio is edited mainly to get rid of my mistakes, not the guests, but occasionally the guests will fluff a line. They'll repeat it correctly and I'll edit out the the fluff there. I started editing with audacity and still do edit with audacity, mainly because I'm used to it and I'm comfortable with it. I have tried Descript and just cannot get my head around it. I, I, it, it sounds great that it's like a document where you can just move audio around in it, but I, I've just not really been able to get to grips with it. I need somebody to... Uh, um, show me that because one of the things I would like to try and do is streamline the production time yeah. on, on the podcast, because it's not just the recording, you've got the editing and the editing can often be maybe four times the length of the audio that you've recorded yeah. by the time you have finished it. And then also you've got to market it 
that you can't just publish it and hope somebody's going to find it. You need to market it either via social or by other means as well. So there's a lot that you need to do to, to get it out there. Oh, yes. Yeah. We all have all the, the street, all the uh, social networks that we have to put it out and advertise and promote through. That's for sure. Um, so what the logo and the music, each episode's got a different, I'm starting to do this with mine now that I can change it with Podbean that I'm on. So your logo is different or the, the thumbnail's different. You've got a main logo as well, which works perfectly. And then you've got the, there is opening music, isn't there? And closing. Yeah, there is. The main logo I use is an image of a statue in Moscow and it's of a Soviet man and woman holding a hammer and sickle. Wanted to have something that sort of represented this wasn't just blokes with tanks that I was going to be talking about, but we were going to capture women's stories of the Cold War as well. And I'm pleased that there's almost about 20% of the uh, stories I've got recorded are women's voices of the Cold War. It should be more, and I'd like to find more. Um, but that, that's where it is at, at the moment. So that's the reasoning behind the, the logo there. The, you're right, every episode has a different episode cover. So if I'm interviewing somebody, I will ask them for a photo or something that I can use that's theirs for the episode cover. If it's an author interview, it will generally be the cover of the book or something like that. But particularly now, Apple Podcasts shows episode artwork. Yeah. Spotify have for quite a while. I think it's something worth doing if somebody's flicking through a list um that episode cover may may draw them in whereas if you've just using the generic podcast out artwork on every episode i think it can just look a bit samey if you're leafing if you're flicking through the uh, episodes because yeah. you're having to then just distinguish on the title yeah, the way that I've worked it with mine, or I am doing, is where so I've got the peas in the pod with the on the microphone stand, where the mm -hmm. headphones. That that's my normal logo for my show, but then I've been playing with. I've done it for years, but now I can add it, make it into the actual show artwork, so that now each episode, I'm trying to make it that you've got that, and then you've got a small, in the corner, you've got the thumbnail of that show as well, of the show that I'm yeah. talking to as well. I don't right. really know otherwise how to do that. It's something that if anyone's got any suggestions, give me a shout. And what do you use to produce that artwork? I, I use something. I use usually just use paint or something on. on... Um, what I recommend is something called Canva. Yep. It's a free online service and it's great for just messing around with images and and overlaying things and putting backgrounds in there is a paid version but the free version is is half decent and that's how i produce all of my podcast artwork is is using that yeah a lot of people have said said about canva before when they've done their talked about their artwork got logo music you've mentioned some we've mentioned a few episodes so far like i said what, what are the three that i've mentioned that i've spoken to you i've listened to the one, like like you said, with the the soldier with the mm -hmm. with the nuclear, and then I spoke the author that wrote coercion. What standout episodes can you think of for for the show over the last five years? There's a hell of a lot. Yeah, of it there. it's difficult. It's three hundred and twenty two episodes, I think, at the moment. So there's a lot to choose from. For me, it, it's often an episode that doesn't get the downloads that I think it deserves. For example, the interview I did with the son of Nikita Khrushchev is a standout because I never thought when I started doing this that I would be speaking to people like that. Another one is when I interviewed Fred Hayes, who was one of the crew of Apollo 13. Wow. So he'd actually been there when the explosion happened and we went through all of that that was really he gave me two hours of his time he was so generous with his time there i interviewed a guy who was in the kgb and was undercover in the us for 10 years until he was arrested and that was really interesting just trying to understand how you cope 
with having different identities for that length of time and hiding those identities from your wife because he married somebody when he was in the US as a KGB spy, despite having a wife in back in East Germany. So it got really complicated and a family in East Germany. So it was all these different who he went back to visit from time to time while he was a spy in in the US. Fascinating wow. story. And that was a two-parter because we had so much to cover there. I think there's a number of them which I find are unexpectedly powerful. I was interviewing a guy who was a US Army tank crewman. And I thought, okay, this is going to be an interview talking about what it was like, what the training was like, that sort of stuff. And he mentioned that his family had come over to visit him when he was there. Yep. And I thought, wow, that, that's unusual. And it was one of those ones where I thought, mm, I need to follow up on that and just find out. I said, did anybody else's family come over to visit? And he said, no. And I said, so what was it like when you saw them? And he just completely choked up. He was really emotional about it. And he said it was, it was just unbelievable. And that the other guys in his unit almost treated them like they were their parents as well and really looked after them and made sure that they were cared for and, and had a good time there. And he'd also had a situation where a comrade of his had been killed in a rail accident which he wasn't able to talk about, but he gave me a written account of what happened, which I read out, which, which was quite an honor to be able to do that. And it, and it was a completely unexpected side of things. And I think that one of the things that I'm conscious of is that I do have a duty of care to the guests as well when they've been on i will try and stay in in contact with them and let them know how the episode's doing and how they're doing and things like that but people want to share their stories i think that they're, they're aware that their time is finite and if they don't share their story then no no one's going to hear it and I think that's one of the things that, that draws them into to contacting me and the respect that I show the guests as well, no matter what their view is, to, if they're a, a hardcore communist or completely the, the opposite side of things, I'd still want to represent their views where I can within the bounds of decency. Yeah, I need to listen to that one as well. The double two-part two episode that you did with the the son of the of that person as well, and that's the one that I'm thinking of now with what I'm about to say, which is that the interesting thing is that you are catching these people, and it's no more obvious than in that situation where you've spoken with that person, and now you wouldn't be able to speak with them because they're no longer with us. So you're getting this these chats with people in this sort of oral history essentially of the these people almost when you can in a sense you're getting it while you can because we are these people are they are going it's an awful thing to say but they they are passing away yeah and the tagline that i have for the podcast is recording the his the personal stories of the cold war before they're lost yeah and that is one of the drivers that I have in continuing to do this. I've had a number of situations where I've been setting up interviews and that guest hasn't made it to, to the interview, their wife or other, or someone else has got in contact with me and said, look, I've just been through his inbox and I'm afraid he's, he or she is no longer with us. And that it's, it's the nature of life, but I'm keen to capture as many of these as I can and as in a as broad a way as possible. I think one of the difficulties I have is that it's an English language podcast. Yeah. So I need people who have uh, a reasonable knowledge of Eng English and are able to express themselves in, in, in English. I think as the tech evolves, maybe I won't need that. And there's going to be some smarter way of, of doing it. But I think with translations, you lose some of that emotion and some of that immediacy that you uh, might otherwise get if, if, if they're speaking in English. 
Yeah, there are podcasts that are in other languages. I've listened to there are there's a podcast that I've checked out that's in French, and then I've listened to somebody who speaks in them. Although my French is not very good, it's very and but I, yeah, it seems to be the main language of podcasts seems to be English. Yeah, I think Spanish is huge as well, and I'd like to be able to cover areas like proxy wars in Africa and Central America. Whilst the Cold War is generally thought of as a war where we didn't go to war, there were yeah. a number of wars fought during that period, which were supported by the West and the Eastern Bloc. And probably the most significant areas where these were in Africa, in places like Angola, and in Central America, in countries like Nicaragua. And I'd like to be able to explore those areas more, but trying to find English speakers who've got experience of those is, or can be challenging, but I'll find somebody. Good, good luck. Good luck with that. I hope that, I hope that com comes through. But all that is part of, like I said, you're helping to keep history relevant and you're making it that people can actually get this information and that, that it doesn't get lost, essentially. Yeah, and I, I have a number of schools that are using the information in their curriculum and uh, universities That's as great. well that are, that are using it. And that I'm delighted with that because that was one of the reasons I started it was to help people learn more about the Cold War. So rather than the grand strategic stuff, the detailed stuff, what was it like to queue up for hours in Poland for a loaf of bread and, and things like that? things that people just take for granted nowadays. And it is growing that, that way as well. And it, it, it will remain the other thing that I wanted to do is make sure that it was free and it will remain free. There is some advertising in there. This is really to cover my time and to cover the cost of producing and, and the hosting costs as well for it. But I'm delighted that it's just appealed to such a broad range of people. Absolutely. So I'm now going to catch it out, possibly, and go away from the list and say to you, are there any books that you think stand out to you that are essential reading for anybody interested in the subject or in going into the subject and any other media? It's difficult because it's a very broad subject. If you're interested in oral histories of the Cold War, there's an excellent book by Bridget Kendall. Uh, yes, I have got it here. Right next to me. The Cold War, an oral history of life between the East and West. There we go. People on the video I, will be able to see that. I would recommend that if you want something that's like a broader look that's quite easy to digest history of the Cold War, then I would recommend this book, Cold War by Jeremy Isaacs and Taylor Downing. It's based on a Channel 4 series, which I think is on YouTube. Okay. So do look that out. But it's a really good sort of like overview of the Cold, of Cold War history in a digestible format. It's not an academic book. Yeah. And loads of pictures, which I like as well. It's like an introduction to it. If you, if, and then you go from there into the broader. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so if uh, someone was starting a podcast of their own, what would you suggest? I'd suggest you need to think about, is this a subject that I am going to remain interested in? And you need to think about how long it's going to be. Because if you want to keep doing it, then you need to have something that, number one, you're not, not going to get bored of. And number two, it's got enough options around it to provide episodes there. I think the other thing is the cadence of when you put out episodes. I started doing the podcast weekly. Yep. And I have produced an episode weekly since March 2018. I wish I hadn't done weekly and I may yet still change the cadence of when I produce it, but the listeners are used to it and I get lovely 
feedback from listeners, things along the lines of, I look forward every Saturday, I sit down on a Saturday evening to listen to your latest episode. And I, I never realized I would have such a responsibility producing this, that I become a regular fixture on that person's calendar. It's a real privilege, but it, it it's lovely to hear people that are enjoying the the content that I put out. I'm sure you get the same. Absolutely. So you are the modern modern version of Weekend World. Uh, yeah, I, I chose Saturday to uh, publish. I'm not sure why. I don't, I don't think there's any particular advantage or disadvantage as to what day of the week you publish on. Because if people just get used to whatever day you're doing, if you are publishing weekly. The other thing that I would recommend is uh, have a look around and see if there's a, a local podcast club or an online podcast club. Okay, now, yeah. I'm a member of uh, Mike's podcast club, which is based in Manchester. So that's M-I-C-S podcast club but they do online sessions every month and it's a really nice bunch of people there's experts on there there's people who are newly starting in podcasting and it's really around just creating a community where we can help each other now i've been podcasting for five six years i learn stuff off of every time that i join one one of their meetings and Martin, if you can put a link in the episode notes for that, because I think it, it's a really, and you'd be welcome to come along as well. It'd be great to see you. I think we've got a meeting next Wednesday evening at six o'clock. It'd be delightful to have you and anybody else who's starting a podcast. So joining a podcast club, I think is a really good way of just having that support network because podcasting can be quite a solitary pursuit. And it's great to, I don't know, the phrase might be wrong, but to nerd out over your podcast challenges yeah. with fellow podcasters. I've just written that down, podcast, Mike's Podcast Club. And, uh, M-I-C-S, yeah. that's it. I'll have a look for that and put a, put a link right. up for it in the notes as well. And Wednesday's good, although not this close to Christmas, but... Cause... This is the last one before Christmas, this one. But yeah, six o'clock start. Two hours at most, but you can drop in, drop out whenever you want. A lot of, you see a lot of people cooking their dinner while we're on the call and stuff like that. Oh, on the call. I thought you meant in, in, in person. I'm, I'm thinking, no, it's a Zoom. To it's Zoom. It's Zoom. It's fire Zoom. We do the odd in person meetup, but it's really took off during lockdown. And they get, I think they've got over 150 members or something that, wow. that have joined now. That's brilliant. So, uh, but you've already mentioned that shows that you like to listen to then. You're probably not surprised that I enjoy history and I enjoy all sorts of history. Cold War is my area of speciality, but I enjoy just general history. And one of the shows that I love is a show called History Rage. Now, History Rage is basically historians who come on to rage about some subject that people get completely wrong or yeah. believe a completely false story around it. So I think their most recent episode, they had somebody on who was raging about the Napoleon movie, who's a Napoleonic historian. I've been on there raging about the fact that people don't treat the Cold War as a real war. You can find that episode on there. But yeah, I highly recommend those guys that produce that. Another podcast I enjoy is Fighting on Film, which is a podcast about war movies. A uh, pair of great guys who I've met in person, along with the History Rage guys as well. Other podcasts I enjoy, We Have Ways with Al Murray and James Holland, which yes. is a World War II podcast with a huge community. But World War II, I've always been fascinated with because of my father's service there and lastly a podcast called the unconventional Sub, which interviews military veterans from around the world not just cold war but more modern conflicts as well and the two guys that that, that run it are ex-british army veterans 
as well. So they, they know their stuff there. And I've in fact interviewed one of them on Cold War Conversations because they were part of a stay behind unit that was right up against the East German border. So if the Cold War had turned hot, they would have stayed behind and then radioed in targets for artillery and rockets to uh, hit from further back in the the battlefield there. And I'm also a regular listener to Pod News, which yeah. is a really useful if you want to stay up to date with the world of podcasting. And also Pod Pod, I also listen to, which is quite fun. And that that is quite often some deep dives into the detail of podcasting. So th those are the ones that I listen to most. Okay. I've just added a ton of those to my listening now. Thank you very much. <laughs> no problem. I'm looking forward to those. So where can people find you and get hold of you then, Ian? Okay. So the best place to find me is coldwarconversations.com. That's a useful place for you to start. There's a tag cloud on the homepage. Uh, sorry, it's by subject. So if you just want, for example, civilian stories of the Cold War, you can click on civilian, or if you want military, or you just want East Germany, Poland, etc., on there. But if you search for Cold War conversations in whatever podcast app you use, you will find us. I'm on social media on Twitter at Cold War Pod, Instagram at Cold War Conversations, Facebook at Cold War Conversations, Blue Sky. I'm in at Cold War Pod. I'm on Mastodon as well. Can't remember what my handle is there, but just search for Cold War Conversations. So I'm almost everywhere, but .com is the best location to start. And if you've got a story that you think would be interesting to the listeners about your Cold War experiences, or you know somebody who has a story, then just go to the contact us section. You can leave a voicemail there, or you can email me directly. Fantastic. Thank you for speaking with me today, Ian. Marv, it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. I'm always pleased to share the joys of podcasting and particularly to share my journey with Cold War Conversation and to help others get into podcasting. Absolutely. I'm going to have to come up with a group chat idea now so that I can bring you back to have a chat with a group of podcasters about something. Have a think about that. Yeah, no, be delighted to do that. Okay, you can find Pods Like Us at, on uh, all streaming platforms and we are on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok and Threads at the moment. And you can contact us through podslikeus at gmail.com. We do have a Patreon if you want to go there that's a pound a month for extra bits and pieces, but I don't like advertising that because I'm British and I don't like asking for money. But you need to, you need to be upfront with it. That's the only way it works. That's what I've found. You need to mention it in every episode and don't be ashamed of, yeah. of mentioning it. But it's only a pound. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But uh, anyway, thank you everyone for listening and hope you listen again to another episode of Pods Like Us. <laughs> Thank you.